Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I want to share in this segment on the characteristics of kingdom ambassadors. In fact, we're going to talk about understanding the original assignment and the role of this thing that we call church. I believe one of the saddest things that have happened in the church is that the church went witnessing. You know, if you are a professional communicator, but your information is wrong, then you've been successful in contamination. You know, nothing is worse than an effective communicator who communicates error. One of the most important statements I've ever found in the Bible that shocked me is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 10. In chapter 10, some words were spoken by Jesus to his disciples. And he was telling them to go out and share some information with people. But before they went, it says, he sent them with these instructions. He didn't just send them, he instructed them first. Uh, his first instruction was shocking. I will quote it. Do not go. Now, if you don't believe me, read Matthew 10 right now. You'll find those instructions made to the disciples. He said, do not go to the Gentiles. Only go to the household of Israel. Imagine, he's sending them out to preach the good news of the kingdom, but he tells them where not to go. How can an instruction from God be a negative when it comes to sharing the good news? Because he knew that they had an attitude toward Gentiles that wouldn't help the message. They were prejudiced. And he knew that therefore they would kind of skew the concepts to fit their prejudice and end up communicating error. Which you, of course, see manifested in the book of, Ma in, in the book of Acts when they tried to make the Gentiles follow the traditions of Judaism. It became a corrupt message. My point is this. We have been so well educated in contaminated truth that even when truth shows up, we call it error. I've been struggling with this myself. I want to talk about, therefore, this aspect of the kingdom of God. I want to talk about kingdom representation, but from the point of view, uh, let me introduce the idea first. Let's talk about kingdom foreign affairs. Every kingdom is a government. I'm going to throw some notes up here. This one is found in Isaiah chapter 9. Matter of fact, it's the part of the chapter and the verse that we really miss. We like the rest of the verse. In Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. That part we know. But then the next statement says, And the government shall be upon his shoulders. Now the, the first statement made about this Messiah is a statement about a government. He is coming to the earth with something on his shoulders. In the days of Isaiah, it was common practice to carry a yoke on your shoulder as a human to carry things that belong to your master. So in the days of Isaiah, yokes were made for both 
men and animals. They still do it in the, in the Far East today. Uh, in the Eastern countries, a yoke for a male or a female was common. A servant wore a yoke. They would carve a yoke the size of your neck with two ends on the, like a piece of wood, and you would carry buckets to carry loads for your master, whether it's water or wheat or rocks or whatever you were taking. You carried loads on your shoulders, around your neck and on your shoulders. That's the very same concept that Isaiah is talking about when he refers to Messiah coming. He says, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Now the next statement implies two things. One, he will be a servant. Only servants carry yokes. And upon his shoulder shall be what? What? The government. So he's coming with something on his shoulders, and it is a government. So two things about him. Number one, he's a servant. And two, he's carrying a government for someone else. Servants never carry loads for themselves. They always carry loads for other people, for their masters in most cases. And so in this case, the image you got to get in your mind is that Jesus, the Messiah, is coming to earth as a servant with someone's property on his shoulders and he's coming to bring it back to those to whom it belongs. Can you get that picture anywhere in your mind? So he comes upon the earth as a servant and he's bringing what? A government upon his shoulders. That's what he bought. He didn't bring a religion. He didn't bring traditions. He didn't even bring prayer meetings. He bought what? A government. Now please notice, if you read that verse carefully, it doesn't say the governments, plural. It's referring to one government, a specific kingdom. The government shall be upon his shoulders, which God which means that God really only wanted one government on earth from the beginning. And in the end, he's going to get it. There are many governments on the earth today, but God only has one on his mind. And he explains what it is in the next statement. It says, and his kingdom shall last for what? Ever. He shall reign over his kingdom forever. So what did he bring? A government, which is a kingdom that's why the first statement of Jesus publicly made is found in the book of Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 and his first public statement goes like this from that time forward Jesus began to preach what the kingdom of heaven has arrived his introduction was a kingdom a government that's what he bought why is this so important because as long as it's a religion you'll never get the message I am trying my best to be delivered from religion. I'm really trying. I mean, this, this, this is tough for me. I'm trying to get rid of religion out of my life. Because religion is holding me back. Religion is man's search for God. It's man's attempt to find God, to reach God. That's religion. That's why religion is filled with activities and rituals and all kinds of traditions. Because we're trying to appease the gods. And in the religious sense of the Christian, Christian it's the God. But it's all the same. We're trying to, 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 to reach out to God, to reach up to God. But, but this message is different. First, this message is God reaching to us. He sent his only son. We don't have to reach for him. And secondly, he didn't bring rituals, he bought authority. He bought power, he bought kingdom power. He bought the ability for you to control your environment again. He bought the power for you to take in char charge of your circumstances again. He brought back to earth the authority to rule the planet one more time. That's what he bought. What did he bring? A government. A kingdom, therefore, is a governing influence and a structure of a king over a territory. Now this point number two is important. A kingdom is a governing influence. All Jesus taught was a kingdom. 
Jesus never taught a religion. He taught a kingdom. He kept on pounding this message that a kingdom has come. The kingdom is like. The kingdom is like. The kingdom is like. And he tried to convince us so strongly that he kept on using these things called parables. Parables. And every parable he tried, he tried to make it simple for people. He, 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 to farmers he said, the kingdom of God is like a seed. To a fisherman he said, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts nets. To a businessman he said, the kingdom of God is like a man who, who invests in a far country. I mean, he kept on using it. He said, look, you got to get this message. To a housewife he said, the kingdom of God is like a woman who, who was looking for a pearl, a coin that she lost. He, he kept on, even the farmer, he said, the kingdom of God is like a man who's working in the field. He says, I got everybody got to get this message, he says. What's so deep about the kingdom? When you dis discover the kingdom truth, it sets you free. Kingdom is what? A structure and an influence. All governments establish a system for foreign relations to represent their interests. Is that true? Now remember, the kingdom of God is a government. Every government in the world establishes a structure for their foreign relations. The purpose for foreign relations is to accomplish your interests in the international arena. That's why governments have foreign offices. Matter of fact, let me move to the next point, help you understand this, that the structure called foreign missions, sounds familiar? Foreign mission, uh, the word is singular, foreign mission. Uh, when I went to visit England some years ago and they took me to the Bahamas Embassy, across the door was not the word embassy, it was, it was the word Bahama Mission. Do you know that in every country, if you read the documents related to uh, a, an embassy, an ambassador, you'll find that that is called a mission. So in, in the Caribbean, we've got countries here where we have foreign mission offices around the world. What are they there for? They're there to represent our government. Now in the United States, they call it what? State Department. The State Department is a department headed up by the chief ambassador who happens to be who right now? Colin Powell. Colin Powell is the chief ambassador of the United States. Now they have dozens of ambassadors all over the world in America, from America, but he is the chief one. He represents the State Department. Everybody the State Department. Now that's what the United States calls it. The British, which we inherit their culture, we call it the mission. The Foreign Mission Department. Interesting words. You religious people, not you, the one sitting next to you I'm talking to, you say, let's go on missions, don't you? We say that the word of Jesus, the last statement of Christ was what? A great co-mission. So we are here, quote unquote, on a mission. But only foreign officers are missions. Governments establish missions in countries to influence that countries with their policies. Hmm. And they are there to accomplish their interests and to protect their interests in that country. It's called a mission, a foreign mission, a state department. Well, what kind of work do they do? It's called foreign affairs. The person in charge of our mission, our chief mission, watch this, our chief missionary is the one who's in charge of the State Department. Colin Powell, perhaps you're watching this program somewhere in your office somewhere, you are a chief missionary. You represent a government called the Federal Government of the United States and your job is to be the chief missionary of your government. So when there are problems in the Middle East, or problems in Croatia, or problems in India, they send the chief missionary to express the government's thoughts concerning the situation. Anybody still with me? 
Can I break it down real fast? When you go to work tomorrow, that means heaven just sent a chief missionary into that job. And your job is to give heaven's perspective on the whole environment and the circumstances you find there. Chief missionary. So all ambassadors are missionaries. The job is not to represent themselves. <laughs> they are there to represent their government. And therefore, ambassadors are charged with carrying out this duty of representing their government. Write that point down. The ambassador is charged with the duty of representing their government. Very important. An ambassador's responsibility is never to represent himself or herself. They represent the government of the country that they're from. That's the ambassador's duty. I want to take you to a quick ride through scripture and talk a little bit about the church then. Why this thing, church, became necessary. We learned in our last session that the word church used by Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 it's a powerful statement, is the word ecclesia. He said, I will build my ecclesia upon the fact that I am the Christ. The word ecclesia means called out one, chosen ones, appointed ones. And the word ecclesia is not a word invented by Jesus. The word ecclesia was literally invented by the Greeks. They're the first ones to invent the word ecclesia, which the Romans adopted in their government when they overran the Greeks. And the Romans took over the world and became successful for two hundred years they ruled the whole world the Roman and one of the key powers that made them do it was their governmental structure the government of Rome was the first empire that built a structure that was similar or just like God's kingdom structure that's why Christ came during the Romans so that the terminologies could be understood no other empire ruled the way the Romans did. Caesar stayed in Rome, but yet he ran the world. He made the whole world like Rome. Matter of fact, the phrase that we've coined is when in Rome, do as the Romans do. In other words, whenever you enter Roman territory, you've got to act like a Roman, think like a Roman, dress like a Roman, eat like a Roman, because you are now in Roman territory. It doesn't mean you went to Rome. It means anywhere where his influence was became just like Rome. Caesar accomplished that. And that's why the Bible says the fullness of time God sent for his son. Fullness means the right setting. He sent Christ. He came himself. God came himself during the time when the empire was established that was just like his. So that when he used terminology, it could be the correct definition. So Jesus could not say, upon this rock, I will build the church. He couldn't say that because there were other churches around. Rome had their own. Caesar had a church, he called it Ecclesia, and it, it was his senate. Today we call that cabinet. Uh, Caesar's senate was his cabinet today. Your cabinet is not the ministers in the House of Assembly or the congressmen. These are not cabinet ministers. They're just representatives of the constituencies. Um, are you following me? An MP and a congressman are constituent members uh, representing people. But a cabinet is different. A cabinet is appointed by the prime minister, by the president or the king, and they personally are appointed by him with no one's opinion. That group is called ecclesia. There's a statement made by Jesus that we still don't understand unless we understand government. It was a political statement. Want to hear it? Many are called. <laughs> a lot of guys get elected to the House of Representatives, but only a few are appointed to cabinet. You never vote a cabinet minister in. A cabinet minister is chosen by the king, or by the president, or by the prime minister. 
Ready for this? The same authority for choice is afforded ambassadors. Ambassadors are never voted in. Your opinion doesn't count. That's a private decision of the leader of the nation. He chooses ambassadors by his own choice. This is ecclesia, church. Christ says, because I am the Christ, the son of the living God, I'm going to choose my cabinet based on the fact that I am king. I am Lord. I am God in the flesh. I am the Christ. Therefore, I could choose my cabinet. Guess who he chose? He's sitting next to one of them. Let me tell you why I'm so glad. And in a minute, you're going to see why this is so important. But you see, if we had to vote you into the kingdom, you would never make it. There are so many folks who are so sorry you are saved. They can't believe God's using you. They know so much about your history and your past. They know who you ate with, slept with, drank with, who you sniffed with. They know you so good. They say, you, you can never be anybody. And God says, oh yeah, I chose them. Yeah. You all better thank God that you don't vote yourself into this kingdom. Praise God. Now you all got to shout a little bit more. Let's say praise God for that. Some of you all got some past that no one knows about. But thank God he overlooks your faults and he makes you a part of his private circle. Imagine God telling Paul secrets after Paul murdered Christians. You would never vote Paul into God's cabinet. Never. He was a killer. And yet God gave him information Peter didn't even get. Paul says, the revelation I have is so much. Thank God that no one voted me in. Praise God. I say, thank God no one voted me into this kingdom. Praise God. It was the choice of the king. The mission of the church then is to represent the government of God and to serve as ambassadors of heaven. Our job is what? To recruit citizens. For the kingdom of God. And later on in this series, we're going to talk about what that means, citizenship recruitment. But let me just suffice it to say at this moment that uh, we're not really re re recruiting new citizens, okay? Uh, the only way to, de to describe this, I think, to help you understand it, would, would use an analogy. Uh, let's say if you were fighting in a war and while we were fighting in the war, the generals came together and they agreed and the war was over. But we were still in the jungle, didn't know. So we were fighting each other, killing each other in the jungle, but the war was over. The message didn't get to us yet. And then they sent out people to all the places in the jungle where we're still fighting to give us the good news that the war is over. That's what it's like. So our job is to go into all the jungle of the world and tell the people, the war is over. He won. Yeah. You don't have to fight anymore. The battle's finished. You can have peace with God again. Ephesians 3.10 tells a little bit about the work. It says it was his intent that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made known to who? the rulers and the authorities of the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose. This is his original intent was that through his cabinet he would make known his manifold wisdom. Are you wise enough to understand that verse? Look at the verse again. It's an interesting verse. Intent means original purpose. His original purpose was that what? Through church. What is church? Now you see, I know where your mind just went. Your mind just went on a building with pews and some stained glass windows and some choirs and you got this all. See that word church is a mess right now in your mind. I know. The word church is a religious organization with a whole lot of candles and a whole lot of songs and traditions and hymn books and, and all these prayer meetings. That's church. But that's not what it means. It means what? A cabinet. A government cabinet. A chosen group of people out to represent 
the mind of the prime minister. Now read it and you see it makes sense. His intent originally was that through his cabinet, the many sided wisdom, the, the multiple types of wisdom of God would be made what? Manifest. He wanted to show what he was like through his cabinet. Funny. Am I speaking English? Am I making sense? Let me give an example. A cabinet does not represent the people. Oh, think, think about it. The cabinet of a country does not represent the people. Uh, the MPs represent the people. The congressmen, but not the cabinet. The cabinet represents the person who chose them. It's a little different way of thinking. That is why when you are appointed to the cabinet, they instantly put you under a law called collective responsibility. This law means that once you are a member of cabinet, you cannot give your personal opinion anymore. Now some of you all gonna get this after I'm gone. That's what Jesus is talking about. A cabinet minister cannot Speak his mind. That's why you get fired from the cabinet. When you speak your mind, you are no longer loyal to the person who appointed you. God says, I have chosen. work tomorrow is his mind his attitude his response to life that's why you should never as a believer listen carefully look at me now you should never ever use this term again I'm gonna give you peace of my mind because as a believer in God's kingdom you have no more mind to give peace of you get it in our government, in the last administration, a couple of cabinet ministers gave a piece of their minds. What happened? Fired instantly. It made no discussion. And it happens in every government anywhere. In the United States, in Jamaica, in, in Barbados. If you disagree with the prime minister or the president in the cabinet, if you disagree, you're gone. You know, some of you were looking at Clinton some years ago and uh, of course most of us figured out Clinton was guilty most of us figured it out but when he met with the press you remember that time he came out of the White House the microphones were there behind him was his cabinet and he spoke and all of them came up and they knew but they couldn't disagree they had to speak around it make it you know it, 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 they just what collective responsibility in other words if someone asks you about homosexuality don't give your personal opinion you got to give the opinion of the king you don't adjust yourself to the environment you adopt his words and tell them thus say it the prime minister Come on, say amen, somebody. But we ain't ready for kingdom life, you see. We so democratic, we discuss everything. Christ says that adultery is sin. Well, you know, Lord, you don't understand how tight it is, you know. You know, Lord, you know, this is, he's fine. She is fine, Lord. I mean, Lord, if you just see what I saw, what do you mean you see what he saw? What are you talking about? You don't discuss stuff with the king. But you see, we, 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 we're still Christians, we're not citizens. We are elders, not ambassadors. Our minds need to be renewed. Let's look at this other point here, I thought it was interesting. What is the ministry of Ecclesia, the church? 
The church as an organization, first of all, does not go to the world as an organization, but it exists to train the saints to go. Is that true? Yes. yes. Uh, the, the, the pastor of a church in God's governmental structure would be considered your chief attache. He would be considered your chief ambassador in that region. So in this diplomat center where there are diplomats meeting today, I would be considered the chief diplomat all right, or I would, I would be, you call me the Secretary of State in this particular local community. Is that clear? I'm Secretary of State. Now, my job is to train you to go back into your local territories and be ambassadors in your job, in your home, in your environment, and to train you to influence that area for the government's interests. That's what I here to do. So what I'm doing right now is we are meeting in the embassy called the Diplomat Center. We are meeting as diplomats, that's what an ambassador is, the, dipl the diplomacy work, and we are here to discuss the constitution of our government to get the mind of our king so we can go out and represent the kingdom of heaven properly. That's what we meet every week for. We don't meet just to have a thrill, we meet to do government business. Can we get that through our heads? So when someone asks you again where you go and tell them, I'm going to the embassy to get instructions from the institution. If you say church, you're going you're to sing back into the pews and the pulpit idea. So you come for a thrill rather than for transformation. When you become an ambassador appointed by the government, do you know what they do? They take you through a training program, intensive training program. The First thing you got to learn, guess what, is the name of every country. <laughs> you know, there are people who didn't know there was such a country as Croatia or, or Afghanistan until there was trouble there. So the first thing that a ambassador got to learn is his world. Paul says, be not ignorant of Satan's devices. Study your enemy. Find out the territory that belongs to you. Find out your whole world. This belongs to you. You know, I, ah, man, pastor, it's incredible the way I'm beginning to get transformed. And I used to love Abraham blessing until I run into Jesus. Abraham was never promised the whole planet. You'll get it after I'm gone. Abraham was promised a little piece of property. Well, that's fine. I praise God for that. If that's what you want, fine. But you see, I used to enjoy Abraham's blessings until I realized his blessings was limited. And I decided I want Adam's blessing. The first original blessing. Come on, talk to me. And God took the man and put him in the garden and said, have dominion over the whole earth. Not just a piece of property they're fighting over right now. You'll get it after I'm gone. So if you are an ambassador, you got to learn the entire place. I've decided before I die, I'm going to visit every country. When I understood this, so I'm, I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving. I'm moving, man. I'm moving. I'm moving. Praise God. See, it never happens until you start believing it. Some of you believe that, that your territory is Miami. <laughs> so you never go beyond Miami. Go there shopping. Praise the Lord. Some of you even, even go a little further. Make it to Orlando. Woo, glory. <laughs> West Palm Beach. Woo, I'm really moving now. You're still in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> but if you start thinking, China is my territory and, 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 and Haiti is my territory and Canada, God will start opening doors for you. Yeah. The kingdom works by belief, faith. If you don't believe something belongs to you, it never comes to you. It never comes to you. So that's why the church is here, to train you to go into all the world. Ephesians 4.10 says this. It was he who gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers to do what? To train the saints. To do what? To work the ministry. Until they become matured and built up in the image of Christ. So the job of the local 
embassy is to train the diplomats to more effectively carry out their what? Ministry. In the Bahamas, all the government offices are called ministries. In Jamaica, they are called ministries. In Barbados, they are called ministries. But in the church, they are called ministries. Ministry is not a religious word. Our education department is called the Ministry of Education. Why? That's what they minister. Our health department is called the Ministry of Health. Why? They are all ministers and they are in the Ministry of Healing. So the next time someone asks you, uh, should a Christian get involved in politics, your answer should be, it's too late. <laughs> clap, man. That's a good basic clap. It's too late. I'm already in it. I'm the biggest politician you've ever seen. And I ain't representing no people. I represent an entire government from another place. This is what we've missed. We've missed the, the concepts. And that's why we are battling. You see, once you are a religion, then you are in the context of other religions. And they become your contestants. I just said something important. Buy this tape, please. I'm going to say it again. If you reduce this thing to a religion, you become one of the religions fighting for souls. So your enemy become people like Islam. Buddhism, Shintoism, and Taoism, and, and Confucianism, and, and, and Baha'i faith. And you begin to you see these people as your enemy. They are not your enemy. God never called Abraham to a religion. But his seed made it a religion. And by the time he showed up, the religion was so strong, it became more important than the word of God. What did they do with their religion? They turned their religion on Gentiles. The Gentiles became their enemies. They turned their religion on the pagans. By the way, pagan, paganism is a religion. It's not antichrist. Pagans are religious people. Romans were worshippers. They worshipped many gods. The Greeks were worshippers. They were pagans. Pagan gods are gods. This is what they worship. There are many gods. So paganism is not a... A, a, a non-religious word it's it's description of a religion and the Jews the Judaizers hated pagans that's why they couldn't eat with people and couldn't talk with people why they made people their enemies sounds familiar some of you hate Rastas you hate Muslims you you hate Buddhists what they ain't like us you made it all religion so you created enemies that ain't there Who are these people? I'll tell you who they are. Christ said who they are. He says, oh, your brother who was once lost. Go get him from the pig pen. He's your brother. These are family. They are God's image that have been distorted. Your perception of a person defines the way you treat them. I mean, you don't have communion or you don't talk with an enemy. Do you? So when you see a lady walking around with a big hood over her face and, and this long thing, your first thought is, I'm going on the other side of the street. Why? We have no dealings with the Samaritans. Sounds familiar. And yet, here comes Jesus walking to the same well, sitting on it and asking her for water. Imagine asking a Muslim for food let's have lunch together oh, oh no my Christianity is so weak it might be contaminated by your Islamic belief Muslims are people Buddhists are people Rastas are people Hindus are people and they are searching just like all of us trying to find God 
Only difference is you found him. No, he found you. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Your job is to introduce him to them and he is a God of love. The church has made itself a religion and now we are in competition. You know, when a mosque goes up, I get excited because I see, you know, the future that place is already predicted. So there's no problem with that. I'm after the people in it. No stone will be left upon another when this whole thing is over. So don't worry about the buildings. It's the hearts of people that, that you need to go after and love them and forgive them and to open up your heart to them. I mean, every sinner that Jesus met became his friend. He hung up with wine bibbers and prostitutes. He was called the friend of sinners. What kind of man is this? Because he went after citizens. He didn't go after converts. They'll get you someday. Let's talk quick about kingdom representation. Ephesians 6 verse 19 says, watch this, write this down please. Paul is now understanding kingdom. He says, pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. And the word gospel here is referring to one message only, and that is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Now, the next statement. If it's, it is for this gospel, the kingdom of God, that I am an ambassador in chains. So pray for me. That I might declare this good news fearlessly, as I should. Paul says, look, I am an ambassador. And I am chained to the government. <laughs> I am a prisoner of the good news. I am chained to the, the, the loyalty of my king. I am resolute in my responsibility to the cabinet. I am chained. When you become a cabinet minister, you are a prisoner. Of who? The cabinet. Can I suggest something? And uh, now this doesn't happen, of course. I mean, it could happen, but you won't win. But I just say this: uh, every cabinet have fights, but you'll never know about the fight. When behind closed doors, when President Bush meets with his cabinet, they they are throwing rocks and bottles at each other. They are disagreeing and shouting and everything. But when they settle on a decision, and the president makes a final decision, everybody comes out and says the same thing. All cabinets have their periods where they got to beat it out. They got to fight it out. They got to get their opinions there. And they work with but not in public. It's never known in public. You all hear me. When they come out of that room, there's only one statement. They says, my government says. You know, one thing I notice about this cabinet we call the church. Sit up straight before we go. Come on. We get in here, we talk about, you know, fuss about, and then we get out there and we tell everybody what's going on in here. Why? You are religious, you are not cabinet. When any pagan attacks one of your brothers, you're supposed to defend that brother, not join in with the pagan. Ah, oh, but we ain't there yet. We ain't mature to the image of Christ yet. Notice how Jesus worked. Watch this. He was, a, he was a fantastic politician. Watch him work. The Bible says he stood before the multitudes every time and he spoke in parables. 
Then this Bible says, and when they were alone, cabinet meeting, he would explain to them all that he had said. They became so upset at his political view that they one time they asked him, they said, Chief, uh, why do you always speak to them in parables, but you speak plainly to us? He says, so that seeing they won't see, and hearing they won't hear. It is given unto you to know the secret. You see, let me tell you something, friends. When you come to the body of Christ, our stuff is secret stuff. We know you for all, we know you ain't living right, but we ain't supposed to announce that to everybody. Y'all say amen loud in here. Some of y'all getting quiet on me. Y'all know some stuff going on in the body of Christ, but don't spread it around in the world. Hallelujah! You go ahead. God will fire people and they don't even know they're fired. He always called them to himself privately. And he would tell them deep things. Then he would say, tell no man about this. See, you don't understand cabinet mentality. We're supposed to protect one another. That's why a prime minister or a president feels betrayed when a cabinet minister speaks against him. Because he's supposed to be protected by the cabinet minister. How do you think Jesus feels when he tells the people, you know, uh, who he is, and then you go and act opposite to it? Disappointed. We tell everybody else to do right, and then you ain't doing right. Jesus wants us to understand this ambassador responsibility. Loyalty to your government. Paul says, I am what? In chains to my government. I'm chained to the cabinet. I can't go where I feel like, do what I feel like, eat what I feel like, drink what I feel like anymore. I got to stay in line with government law. I used to go to the zoo and used to spend out nights and used to sleep around and used to drink and used to this. I used to, but now I am chained to another government. Uh, Y'all can say amen before I close this morning, all right? Say amen. In, in other words, you can't just do what you feel like anymore. We, we have collective responsibility now. That's why the Bible says when one rejoice, when one is sad, all suffer. Collective responsibility. Don't ever laugh at the mishap of your brother. Don't ever rejoice in evil when your brother falls, your sister falls. Fall with them and pick them up. Come on, say amen, man, before I go. See, we need to learn kingdom thinking is different. Peter told Jesus, he said, Jesus, if you knew what they did to me, you wouldn't forgive them. How many times should I forgive them? He said, look, in this government, we forgive them 70 times. Oh, you miss once, you don't sing in this choir no more. You miss once, you don't come back to be no deacon. You get pregnant, you can't be in the choir no more. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? <laughs> Only difference between you and the girl who got pregnant is you didn't get catch. <laughs> Collective responsibility. Say it with me. Collective responsibility. That's cabinet law. Pray ye one for another, so that ye may be healed. That means if somebody's sick, we all sick, Paul says. Pray for them to be restored. Ephesians 2.19, write this one down. It says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens. I like this. But you are what? Fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Write that down. It's a heavy statement. You know, the Bible calls you citizens. 
Not Christians, you know, citizens. A Christian is a religious creature. A citizen is a legal creature. A Christian has emotions. A citizen has rights. <laughs> a Christian cannot demand anything from God. A citizen have rights to demand because of law. You are fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. Everybody say, I'm a citizen. I'm a citizen. Say it again. You know how powerful a citizen is? Man, you got your passport. You hold your passport in your hand. We were coming through the airport yesterday. I tell you, those passports are dangerous. They checked us every point. All through, you know, at Heathrow Airport. And we stopped off, you know, Miami Airport and then Nassau. And everybody, they want to see the passport. And the passport says, property of the Bahamas government. In other words, you don't belong to yourself when you are a citizen. Glory, hallelujah. I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but you see, a citizen totally takes the responsibility for your life out of your hands. Still ain't got it. Check your passport when you go home. It doesn't belong to you. It proves that you belong to a government. <laughs> And the only reason why they let you through is because you don't belong to you. Yeah. You ain't got it. You see, they check in to see if you belong to an authority. You can't move without a passport. Why? Because you don't belong to nobody. Some of you are getting it soon. But when you become a citizen and they give you their passport, wherever you go, they know that if they say yes to you, they say yes to the government. If they say no to you, they say no to the government. And ain't nobody going to say no to Jesus, I'm telling you. When you tell the devil, move on the side, here's my passport. Come on, y'all praise the Lord one time. When, when you walk in the authority of the kingdom of God, then you represent an entire government. This is not religious talk. I'm talking about tomorrow when you walk out of your door. Walk out with a different mentality. I belong to the government of God. Heaven backs me up today. Woo! When the devil comes against me, I can say, in the name of the king. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I tell you, them demons saw the sons of Sceva. They said, well, let's see. <laughs> Paul, we know, because we check his passport. Peter, we know he got passport. Miles, we sure of he got passport. But who are you, the demon says? Christ said, when you go, you ask everything in my name. Don't use your own name. Some of you are wondering why President Bush stood up that day. September 12th and he said we'll do something about this something will be done about this and tears came to his eyes Are you wondering why they mobilized thousands of soldiers bombers missiles you know why because somebody touched the citizens Now, if you, being human, know how to do, give good gifts to your children, how much more? <laughs> Lift your hands and shout hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Don't you walk around this week with depression and fear and, and all kind of intimidation and people trying to threaten you and take your job and you will get promoted and you never... Hey, calm down! Next time somebody threatens you, just tell them, be careful. I don't want to stir up the army. Come on, clap your hand. That's the truth. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. 
Now some of y'all don't understand that. By the way, the army is not people. In our kingdom is what? Angels. Christ stood before Pilate. Pilate said, do you know who I am? I am a, a, an ambassador of Caesar. And I got the power to take your life or give it to you. Christ never spoke until then. He said, I got to say something, Pilate. I got to talk to you. You were doing so good until you threatened me. Don't threaten me. Come on, somebody. He said, Pilate, let me tell you something. Even now, I could call 10 legions of angels right now. My God. Come on, shout hallelujah, somebody. Citizenship. Citizenship. Oh, I feel the anointing of God coming on my body now. Some of you are just getting it now. See, all this fear you've been walking around with, mm -mm, that ends today. There's no intimidation when you know who your government is. You know, a scripture was read today. I want that scripture to be inscribed and put on a wall out there somewhere. It says, your throne is established for Ever. In other words, this government I'm working with ain't no Taliban, no terrorist, nobody can get to that government and that government ain't going nowhere. You can't vote that government out. The last time someone tried a coup on that government, it lasted for one blink and it was over. Y'all shout amen somebody. Yeah, you got it. Woo! When the government was finished, that cool dictator became the devil forever. <laughs> Praise God. That's kingdom citizenship, brother. It's more than Christianity. Paul says we're no longer aliens. Alien means that you ain't no illegal immigrant. Illegal immigrants have no rights, no authority, and they have to beg to live. They have to sneak around to survive. Paul says, you ain't that no more. Hello, somebody. You are now a legitimate, legal, blood-bought, sanctified, hand-picked, chosen, elected. Your shout, man. Praise God. I just got something, Pastor Richard. You see, in the other kingdoms, they elect, the people elect the, gov the, 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 the representative. But in the kingdom of God, the government elects. Got it done? He says, therefore, make your calling sure. Make sure you're elected. You ain't just joining some church, hanging around, you know, slipping in in the back and trying to make it to heaven by association. <laughs> Have you been elected by Jesus to be in this cabinet? If you haven't, don't leave this room without your election being sure. Submit yourself to Christ and let the Holy Spirit live inside you today and leave here as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Shout amen, somebody. Praise God forevermore. Citizenship is what it's all about. You all sit down. I'm going to hurry up quick, quick. Praise God. I want to get to something here. First, Second Corinthians 5. Look at this verse 18. Powerful statement. It says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a, the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting men's sins against them. Interesting. And he has committed now to the embassies, to us, the message of reconciliation. He's given it to the ambassadors. Watch this. We therefore, oh Lord have mercy, Christ ambassadors we are as though God were making his appeal through us now 
We therefore implore you, we beg you, on the government's behalf, <laughs> be reconciled to God. God made him, the king, who had no sin, to be sin for you and me, so that in him we might become rightly positioned again with the government. What's your job? There's your job description right there. That's an ambassador's job description. You want to know why you were saved? There it is, right there. Not to go to heaven, to go to earth. Ambassadors are useless at government headquarters. I don't know how to talk to y'all. I'd close in a minute. See, whenever a government recalls an ambassador, it's for two reasons only. One, that ambassador violated government order. Or two, the territory is uncontrollable. Warfare is going on there, something. He ain't safe. <laughs> it's getting good to me. So now we got to discuss something here. If you can't wait to go to the government headquarters, could it be that you are afraid of the territory? Or maybe the territory was no longer under the control of the government. Or have you been recalled because you ain't living right? Now, 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 listen, the Constitution does say so. In the Constitution of our government, it says that some has even died so that God could save their soul. It's called ambassadorial recall. Let me kill you before you go to hell. Is that plain enough? God said, look, you've been doing good. Right now you're messing up. I'm going to kill you. I'll kill you while you're saved. You ain't no use to me in the territory. You're misrepresenting the government, so let me get rid of you. I'll bring you home to the headquarters. Some have even died. I have a question. Is this territory under control? Well, if we read the Constitution, the last memo we got from the government, the email says, this is the email we got from the government. The email says, no man can enter a strong man house until he first binds the strong man and takes away the spoils and give it to the children. The next memo came afterwards and says, it is finished. We got another memo after that which says, he who descended also ascended he also descended and took captivity captive and led captives in his train and he ascended and is seated on high right hand of God the power and therefore he said unto the children 
I give you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy, and none of these spies shall by any means harm you. Is the territory under control? The only part that ain't under control is the part you didn't take under control this week. God gave you your job, he gave you your career, and he gave you your discipline to go into that area and repossess that area for him and to occupy it until he comes. That's your job description. So heaven is not your primary objective. Earth is. Stop running from things that belong to you. Stop avoiding things that are yours. The earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof. Everything that dwells in it belongs to your daddy. That means anyone that has it illegally is illegal. You have authority as a citizen to demand your property and government backs you up. Paul says, we are ambassadors of Christ. In our next session, I'm going to give you 12 distinctive qualities of an ambassador. When you hear them, you will never think the same way again. I am becoming what I am becoming right now because I understand these 12 qualities. I used to be so afraid of life until I understood the powers of an ambassador. That's what you are. You will never think small again once you think like an ambassador. You will never be scrunching around and begging and trying to make it again when you understand you're an ambassador. You will never allow anyone to invade your territory if you understand you're an ambassador. You will never again be intimidated by any situation once you realize you're an ambassador. Now you can be a Christian and I'll meet you somewhere else. But you become the ambassadorial mental mentality that God intended. You'll be just like Jesus. You begin to think like him. He knew his rights as the son of God. And he says, as the father have sent me. As the father have sent me. As the father have sent me. So send I you. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.